All right, welcome back, everybody. Please take a seat. Put your forms at the back with Leslie. All right, welcome back, everyone. This is the third presentation in session 3C, Construction and Alternative Delivery. I'm Hunter Bennett Daggett, and our final presenters today are Muriel Gesa Teufel. Sorry, I messed up a little at the end there. Muriel has more than 23 years of experience in the Pacific Northwest, working in various capacities on wastewater capital projects implementation, including planning, design, and construction. She is now managing the CMGC delivery of the Secondary Treatment Expansion Program for BES, a major investment in the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant. Muriel has a bachelor and master's degree in chemical engineering and is a board certified environmental engineer. We also have Dick Talley. For 35 plus years, Dick has enjoyed a career assisting agencies and private companies design, construct, and operate, and has delivered major capital upgrades utilizing a variety of delivery models from traditional design bid build and including various forms of alternative delivery, including CMAR, EPC, and design build and hybrid thereof. Dick serves as Stantex vice president and area manager from the company's offices in Portland. Thank you so much. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming to the last presentation of the day. And uh, especially the women out there. So I'm going to say it. We're going to finish on time so we can go to the women's networking thing. <laughs> so we're not going to make you wait too long. So it's me and Dick today in front, but there's a huge, giant, big team that's working on this project. And just raise your hand if you're working on STEP. I know I can see a lot, and that's you know a fraction. So thanks. Feel the love. Thank you. So this might be a repeat if you've listened to some of our presentations, but um, this is about the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant in Portland, Oregon. Um, it's the largest plant in Oregon. Um, it's a CSO plant, so it's pretty big. It has a big swings uh, between dry weather flows and wet weather flows. So dry weather flows are about 60 MGD and wet weather flows go up to 450 million gallons per day. So there's a, a, a big, a lot of infrastructure at the plant to deal with this. Um, it has two treatment trains, so it, what we call dry weather train and then a wet, like a wet weather train. The driver for this step program you're hearing about is we have a mutual agreement and order to add more secondary clarifiers. And so that's the intent is to uh, increase the biological treatment capacity and not use our chemical, uh, chemically enhanced primary treatment as much. So um, that said, the plant is old. The last big expansion was in the 70s. So when you say add two clarifiers, that also means, oh, and change the electrical system and oh, change the pump station in between. And oh, the solids handling facility can't take the solids. And so it's a bit of a domino effect. So it became a big project quick. Um, so it was a very constrained site also. It's not like you can say, sure, let's add clarifiers right here. No, we have to demo something before we put the clarifiers and then to keep the plant operating while well, you have to build interim facilities so that you can demo. And it's a lot of logistics and that has pushed us into this alternative delivery model with a CMGC. And so that was to manage risks, uh, mainly safety risk to our own workforce and to the contracting force. Uh, but it was also to maintain plant operation. That was a big deal for us. And then the schedule driver was huge. So those things all pushed us to CMGC. Right. It was just showing you that it's covering a big swath of the plant. So, um, so I'm sorry if this is a repeat from my earlier presentation, but it's a construction manager, a general contractor approach. Really what it means is that you're not gonna do a low bid process to do construction. And what it means, you're gonna bring a contractor on board during your design phase. So that's the big change. And you're selecting your contractor on qualifications and other criteria. So, um, the earlier, the better, because you want, since you're bringing the contractor on board, you want to benefit 
from their input. They're sitting at the table during design. So you don't wanna do this at 90%. You wanna do this as early as you can. So in our case, we did it at a 20% uh, design. And the idea is that everybody's sitting at the table to figure out the best way to deliver the project. So a big part of that concept is that since you have the contractor who will build the project, I'm just sitting in the room there. <laughs> um, the idea is that you're going to minimize uh, your surprises at the end of the project when you enter in construction. It does not mean you don't have change orders in case that's what you're thinking. You still have change orders, but uh, you're minimizing a lot of those unknown risks or alternatively, you identify those risks during that design phase so that you can set up the contracts and you know, set, set up in a fair way so everybody shares the risk uh, appropriately. So um, we did hire a program manager to help us do that because I hadn't managed a project this big before and we didn't have the in-house uh, knowledge to do this. And we also didn't have enough resources. So here comes Stantec. <laughs> so we hired Stantec to help us um, for the program support um, and the expertise. So Keywith at the end of the day was brought on board just in time for a 20% design, which is a, a new deliverables that, that we had set. So typically we do 30, 60 and 90, but we thought a 20% would be a good, not too late, not too early, just good enough so we can get preliminary input. And it gave us a chance to get the contractor on board and for all of us to figure out what the project actually is other than the clarifiers. So once the contractor is on board, that's really where that value engineering story begins. Which is the point of this presentation. So value engineering traditionally is, and it's required for our large projects in the city, you get this independent team, they fly in, they come for a week or two, um, look at the design and then provide their comments and ideas to the design team, the design team evaluates, and then the whole process takes a month or two and that value engineering team goes away. That process still has value, but when you go alternative delivery and you have a contractor that's sitting at the table with you, with your design team and with the owner in that design phase, you can really leverage that for more constructability input and more value engineering throughout the project life. Um, especially in our case, um, we actually hate the word value engineering. Like if you ask our no and staff, operation and maintenance staff, they just roll their eyes. They hate it because it just means you're gonna cut scope and they don't get what they want. And then the engineering team, they hate it too because they know there's gonna be another project later to add whatever was cut. <laughs> so we don't have a good experience with value engineering uh, typically. super fancy graphics. Okay, so the collaborative nature, so really what we mean, it's, it's that leverage what you have, the resources you have. You have a team that's spending a lot of time during the design phase, uh, get their knowledge and, and keep each other in check for the best value. So um, this is saying the same thing. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Where do I point with this? <laughs> so everybody knows that we've had giant challenges in the last years. I mean, this project we brought Kiwit on board in 2019 and um, the design had started just a couple of months earlier. And uh, so then COVID hits and we've got this giant project. Everybody moves remotely. We keep the design on track Then we have weather issues and social unrest and then supply chain disruptions in the war. And that actually has pushed us to even, you know, sort of put the VE on steroids because um, our costs went up, schedule went crazy. And, and it just pushed the, the entire team to 
sit at the table and figure out how do we deliver this project um, and really turn every single rock that we could find uh, to figure out uh, opportunities. So then Stantec comes in and um, uh, Dick is gonna tell about the tools and processes of how we uh, did the vet, this continuous value piece. Thank you, Muriel. So Muriel talked a little bit about some of the challenges that, that STEP um, encountered. Well, the driver behind all of it was the MAO, obviously of getting done by December of 2024. So one of the first things we had to look at was how do we rearrange the project in terms of what was on critical path. And so that was a first step that we really looked at um, collectively with, with the contractor and, and the designer and the owner of what really needs to be done when and in what order. And what came out of that was the decision to break the project into various parts and pieces, right? And so we had early out packages that were looking at these interim facilities that Muriel talked to about temporary facilities, about moving staff around so we could get the demo quicker, so we could get the ground improvements quicker, multiple GMPs. And so that whole process, um, took place between 20 and 30%. So once the 20% estimate came in and we realized where we were, both in terms of scope and schedule, we then had to backtrack a little bit and spend a little bit of time kind of reorganizing and reprioritizing. At that point, um, both Jacobs um, and Kiwit began a process of, of uh, dual estimating at each phase, right? Trying to get cost alignment between various design milestones or design concepts at both the 30, 60, and 90%. And so these independent cost estimates were pulled together and then reconciled at each design milestone. And our target each time was trying to get at least the direct construction cost reconciled within 5% between the independent cost estimator and, and the uh, CMGC's estimate. So that each time that we had a milestone, we had a truing up, if you will, of the budget and could track it from a from growth, scope growth versus how much was all of the challenges that Muriel talked to, that you're, you're all you're all that battling those same challenges. I mean, I think I'm in a room full of friends right now on that. It, um, it doesn't matter what project we've got out there right now as an industry, we're challenged with delivery times, um, construction pricing, construction availability, labor um, shortages. Other tools we looked at um, was really, and Muriel talked about the team, and, and that's probably, the, the, the punchline of everything today that Mary and I are gonna talk about is the, the incredible um, pride that everybody takes in step in terms of working together as a team. Um, everybody's encouraged to engage in the project, to engage in the design, engage in the construction ability reviews, safety, cost estimating, schedule progression, uh, permitting. You heard some of the, of the challenges earlier in some presentations on permitting. And each one of those, um, design milestones obviously had a, a large uh, input from design workshops. We really strongly encourage the contractor, trade partners, vendors, everybody to participate in those because in the world we're working in right now, things really change over months. When you, when you wait between 30 and 60%, it's just too long. The world's too dynamic. And we encourage these VE ideas from all parts of, of the team, right? Whether it came from operations or engineering or design or construction or construction management, um, always trying to get everybody focused on, is there a better way, is there a better value, not scope cutting? Uh, we were pretty, that was kind of a no-go, no-fly zone, right? Was cutting out performance. And so um, we were very fortunate to have Keywit on the job. They had a very sophisticated approach to trying to track and manage. Um, they had a term called decision An analysis and resolution team. We kind of acronymed it as DART and it became our DART board. And essentially we tracked um, all opportunities through each one of the um, design milestones in these design workshops that we talked about. It was very simplistic. That was probably the beauty of it in that it was an Excel based tool. All of us had access to it through SharePoint. And Kiwit did an excellent job of staying on top of it and keeping it current, giving us rough orders of magnitude as ideas popped up. Um, we went through a, a very simple um, stoplight approach where if an idea came in and it had, everybody liked it, it got a green 
and we proceeded forward and then started vetting it out through the design process. If we were like, it was a good idea, but we didn't really know much about it and we needed to know more, we tagged it as a yellow. And if it was something from the owner's perspective or the designer's perspective that it was just, don't go there, then we gave it a red and, and it uh, stopped at that point. Very quick, um, this, this DART tool was uh, updated very systematic, uh, very regularly. How about that word? Um, the, uh, and then as, as these ideas uh, evolved from green to yellow to green, um, then we worked back through the Jacobs team and got those design changes in. And, and uh, the Jacobs team, just remarkable uh, agility in being able to take these ideas, move them into the design, stay on track with meeting our design milestones, and really, really work with a dynamic um, process. It was, it, uh, Dave and I were grimacing when we got to 90% design milestone, right? I, almost all of us know that when you get to 90%, you're, you're pretty much stamp ready, you're ready to go to the field. And, and we had to pump the brakes and stop and do another round of VEs at 90%. And, and I'm sure if you're a design manager in a room, you, you, you cringe when you hear doing VE exercises at 90% because there's a lot of documents at that point get impacted specs, drawings, details, you've got to chase that all the way through. And, and, and Jacobs did just a remarkable job of managing that volume. So at the end of the day, what did we end up with? Well, we had 203 proposals um, were input and evaluated through the DART process. 110 of them were accepted and, and engaged, resulted in about 20% savings off of the GMP um, as we went along. And obviously at the size of, of STEP, it, it's in the millions of dollars that were saved through this process. Through it, we were able to track whether um, by process area, so we could look at different scopes of work within the, within the program. Um, the STEP program is, is pretty, touches a lot of parts of the plant. So we were able to track it, whether it was in um, solids handling or in clarifiers or wherever. We were also to track it by discipline. So we could see whether a lot of our VE ideas were coming out of structural or electrical or whatever. So we were able to track it both ways and then plot and kind of, kind of tag it out um, so we could see where the areas of, of improvement could be recognized um, most efficiently. So, um, you know, a couple of rules of it. We, we said, hey, look, if, if the ROM is coming back at $50,000 or less, it's just not worth pursuing because by the time we account for the extra design efforts to incorporate it and schedule, um, that's been our driver um, mercilessly on this uh, whole program is to try to get Kiwit underway with construction so that we could hit that December 2024 date. So that was kind of a threshold. I think it's pretty unique to anybody as to where they want to set that, but I strongly encourage that there's some point where it's not worth the effort to continue to chase something. So kind of some examples, I'm, I'm sure you're like, well, how did that all come about? You know, some of the areas were in ground improvements. We're, we're right on the banks of the Columbia Slough. We've got a lot of liquefiable soils. And so the site needed a, a, an enormous investment to get it seismically resilient. And so that was um, a very challenging exercise. And again, the combination of Jacobs and, and Kiwit continued to pound away at that and, and look at different ways of doing um, ground improvements. We got about $17 million worth of savings out of, of just ground improvements. Um, operations and maintenance facilities this is another big key area. Um, I talked earlier on about how we had to kind of reprogram the whole sequence of activities. Originally, it was planned to build the new operations facilities first. And schedule just didn't allow that to happen because that truly put everything on critical path through the operations facility. So we had to back up, reprogram that. And that's when some ideas came up about reutilizing or repurposing some of the existing assets that VES had on site. Resulted in about 20 million in savings. Um, this is the next one I'm, I'm extraordinarily proud of because we oftentimes hear about how our government doesn't work in our best interest all the time. And I really want to highlight this because this was a partnership that was created between BES and the Port of Portland. Port of Portland needed dirt because they had a project that they needed to fill. BES had excess dirt because they were digging holes in the ground for the clarifiers. And it literally was kind of this little match made in heaven. And it didn't take a lot of effort to put the parties together work out some agreements, do some environmental testing, make sure the dirt was clean. And it shortened from what the original design concept was, was essentially pick all the material up out of the Columbia plant, haul it all the way to Hillsboro to a landfill. Um, 
And if you think about not only were the dollar savings there, but a lot of the things we try to do in our industry and reduce carbon footprint and truck haul and traffic impacts and all of that of moving that material to where we were only hauling it a couple of miles, essentially on site. Um, big savings, about $6.2 million in, in just primarily diesel savings. Um, everything else is pretty much the same, but it's just pretty much diesel. Um, we raised the clarifiers, we reduced the size of them. That was about 5.7 million. And, and it went all the way down to things like um, fittings, ductile iron plate fittings, right? These are things that all of us have really learned to grapple with in the last two or three years is that the normal things that we do and we've done all of our careers are now really being challenged by material shortages and pricing uh, cost indexes in it. So we, we looked at things like changing out fitting types, right? So a lot of good ideas that came forth um, other kind of rules of, or, or lessons learned were around trade partner engagement, getting your trade partners on early and, and getting them to participate in that pre-construction um, phase. We were very fortunate to have some really good trade partners that brought a lot of good ideas to the table early. Uh, major equipment vendors were, were identified early. And um, in some cases we actually went out and pre-procured and got them at least that part of the pricing locked down, right? Um, and, and, and the escalation part of this was what was causing us a lot of grief on the budget. Um, we had great electrical and instrumentation controls trade partners um, that took a look at the city standards and the design standards and made suggestions to those in terms of equipment availability, lead times and cost savings, um, particularly in light of, of what we're all seeing and experiencing in our industry right now. And then we got a lot of specialty subcontractor uh, input right around those ground improvements. So there was a lot of uh, things that were looking pretty good. Um, we were pretty proud of ourselves when Merrill and I put together the the uh, abstract for the, but that was a few months back, right? And and um, a few things have happened since then, um, namely the war in Ukraine and the impacts that that did to the energy markets and particularly the stainless markets. And so although we were still holding pretty close to budget 14% over where we were at the 30%, we started seeing that the, you know, the materials of construction were looking at like a 64% growth over that same period of time. So in about a nine to 12 month window, um, we were seeing our materials prices um, going up substantially. And so Muriel and I have a lot of um, conversations about control what we can. We don't have a lot of control what goes on in Ukraine. We don't have a lot of control what happens in the global markets, but the things that we do have control over are the things where we have really focused. And one of those was a continuous VE concept where we're just continually looking at different ways of doing the business, um, engaging all of these partners, listening um, instead of directing, right? Hearing what people are telling us, acting upon that intel to make good decisions that benefit the ratepayers uh, first and foremost, but at the same time, keeping risks um, in a place where everybody can price them accordingly and accept them. So we just keep working on that. We're not done. Um, obviously we've got to a GMP now and, and we've got most of that uh, locked down, but I don't think we want to stop there. The VE is going to continue um, all the way through construction. Um, we've kind of got this esprit de corps built between the teams now where it's, it's a spirit of um, healthy competition, let's say, right? Everybody's inspired to come up with good ideas. They get through a very formal vetted process and then enacted upon. So we control what we can control, right, Meryl? So with that, I'll turn it back to you. So, um, yeah, I think the... Uh, there were lots of lessons learned and, and the, I mean, a lot of it is just the, the delivery model uh, is just very collaborative. And so transparency and communication goes a long way. Um, we didn't talk a lot about O&M, but they have been super involved in this project and in the VE proposals. We call them opportunities because there's such a reaction to the word VE. <laughs> So we're calling them opportunities, and then they understood we were talking about VE. So, <laughs> um, so again, so just repeating on some earlier uh, points: the earlier you can bring your contractor on board, the more you can leverage that knowledge. Uh, we we at BES, anyways, um, had a lot of 
I mean, it was an eye opener because we don't, we just don't do cost estimates <laughs> during design. And we don't, we don't know, we just, we specify stuff that we specified 50 years ago. We have a 50 year old plant and, you know, it's always been done that way. We've always used ductile iron here and we've always used copper over there. So that's what we're gonna use. And now, now you put the cost perspective and the lead times in perspective and you go, oh, maybe I don't need that. <laughs> And, and those are the great discussions to have because it really pushes you to question and, and then have certainty on what you're getting is the best value for the outcome you want. And we, just, we didn't have those conversations before. So this was a big eye opener for us. Um, yeah, the methodology for the transparency in that V process is key because there's always, um, a perception that you're trying to hide something or you're making decisions and you know you're not telling people why so so capturing those proposals and then and then you know documenting uh, not doesn't need to be a big great book uh, you know you just it's like we had an excel spreadsheet but it was enough information that we could track what we based the decisions on uh, and we rarely i don't think we even had any that were looking at Bargavi here. <laughs> she was very involved in those uh, the discussions. Um, I don't think we had items that were management just said no. It was just always, it was the, that was the best decision. There's never a perfect answer. And so I think we were able to bring people on board. Um, so in our case, we did have the Jacobs team uh, and then the, they had a sub doing the cost estimate. So we felt like that qualified as the independent cost estimating team. So if you have a different kind of project and even if you have a, a low bid project, maybe you could consider hiring an independent cost estimating team to just help you uh, get informed as you issue your project deliverables. Um, so those are the latest, uh, news that we got you know it's it's very demoralizing when you your costs keep going up after all this effort like you every, you know it was like wins you we were competing like hey i've got a good idea and then it made it in and see how much i saved on the project and then you get to the next cost estimate and it's all gone all these savings you thought you were getting are gone and so explaining that to the team and telling them you know if we hadn't gotten these savings, we would have been even worse. And then it would have been very painful because eventually, eventually you can't pay for it. And so, um, so it's all worth it. Um, this continuous VE, that's how we ended up calling this continuous VE, but to me felt like it was also almost mini partnering or continuous partnering with the team because it makes you um, really see the value of what you're putting on the sheet of paper for, for construction. And so it really forces you to talk from different perspectives, you know, from the contractor who's building the thing, from the design team who's, you know, choosing the pump, and then from the operator who's going to push the buttons. Um, it, so it just brings everybody at the table to, to, to bring the different perspectives and, and talk through, okay, this is what we need. It's not perfect. Maybe it's perfect. But usually it's not, and but this this is what we what we want as a, as an organization. So I mentioned at the beginning, there's lots of people working on step. Um, Dave Green here is leading the big Jacobs team. Um, we have Kiwit. So Mark is not here today. We've got Eric representing Kiwit, um, and then Dick and I. So thank you, and we'll take some questions. Uh, so I have a question about, can you discuss maybe briefly some of the methodology you did use to solicit value engineering opportunities you talked about? Like, was that just, you know, having the contractor route go over the documents at the 60%, 90% review and provide con like feedback in the same way that um, the owner would, or was it meetings? What, what sort of things yeah. did you use to actually solicit the, those, the feedback? 
Yeah, I think the first step definitely was follow the money. And so Key would, would have a list, you know, as they go through their estimate, they would just say, hey, did you know you have 90,000 linear feet of pipe <laughs> in the building? <laughs> or, you know, they would, they would just point out things. Uh, then we have, then we just set up workshops. We set up a lot of workshops and I mean, we knew costs were getting really high. Um, I mean, the project, even before COVID and the inflation, it was just, it's an old plant and the, the scope creep that's not really an elective. It's just because your electrical system is too old and, you know, but it's all the stuff that you didn't really think you needed. And now you realize, yeah, I'm going to need it. Uh, so the costs were getting getting up and so we had workshops and at the workshops it, it was a little bit of a competition every team went back to their <laughs> drawing boards and so Dave you can speak I don't know how you did it internally but like we had a on the shared Excel sheet we had a tab for BS we had a tab for Jacobs we had a tab for uh, Kiwit and everybody from their teams put some ideas some proposals in that spreadsheet explain it briefly and say, you know, why would you change it? And, and then it was a little bit of a competition, like, hey, I got this idea. And then that, the person would have to talk about the proposal. And, and then as a, as a group, um, you know, it was all virtual. As a group, you would green, red, uh, yellow light it. That's how it happened. Yeah, uh, just a little follow-on question with the uh, about the VE ideas. I was wondering if you have any perspectives on, um, I guess, relative to the concentration of VE ideas relative to the design, where the design was at. Um, did you get more VE ideas and, and, and input at 30% or 60%? Just kind of curious about the timing, uh, I guess, relative mm -hmm. to a traditional VE process where you sometimes wait till 60 or even 75, 90% uh, design. I do feel like we got more to 60%. Yeah, the 60% deliverable was really where we had the most V. I see a lot of nodding. Yeah, I got it right. 60% <laughs> is where we got the most V items. Um, we still got a fair amount of the 90%, which was a little scary, but uh, this is where everybody stayed calm and said, let's just go through it and see what it, what happens. We did red light a lot of items there because it was, no, we're not, we're not going there, but, um, but we still have some decent proposals. Um, Dick, I think you mentioned that you um, had a lot of value in bringing trade partners, subcontractors in early. What was that process? How did you decide who you were going to use and balance competitiveness with um, their, their willingness to share value engineering ideas and their willingness to share their uh, special sauce, if you will? process, he would identify several key trade partners as part of their CMGC proposal. So those were um, kind of baked into the process, right? And then as we went along and we started um, to identify major equipment vendors, um, then through through Jacobs' design process and VES's um, piloting work and stuff, we were able to identify more key partners. Uh, and, and you 
the second part of your question is probably the thing that has been the most fun, right? Is when you think about it in terms of a VE process, right? There's not a lot of incentive. Uh, no offense to any designers in the room, but there's not a lot of incentives to a design firm to change their design, right? Um, nobody wants to go back for change orders. So, you know, it's just awkward. The contractor is not necessarily really incentivized to save money either, because as they save money, they're giving up fee, right? And so the motivations there have to be more in the spirit of teamwork and how do we collectively build something that we're all proud of and that we all play a role in. And, and there's, it's, it's not a hard and fast um, motivator like dollars, right? And so trying to build that culture is probably what we're probably most proud of. Um, and because there's, it's hard to get people motivated to, if you're a designer and you've been plowing away at something for six months and somebody comes in and says, I don't like that, change that, right? That, that's, that's a difficult message. And it's, um, it, it challenges the very uh, thing that we all are as engineers, right? If you go to a, to a contractor and ask them to cut their effort down on something or, or change up their potential fee, those are difficult conversations, but that was the secret, I think, uh, to get the trade partners, to get the subcontractors and consultants into the room and the owners and the operation staff to recognize that we're all in this together. And, and the goal is to try to get the highest quality for the best value we can collectively as a team. And, and, and that has probably been what I think I, I know from my own personal, that's probably been the biggest, um, proudest moment or, or most gratifying, right? because it's not normal for all of us to have those conversations, right? Who won the competition? Oh, <laughs> Ooh, who won? I mean, well, oh, we did. We we tallied. We tallied. We tallied. Depends if you count the number or the dollars, or <laughs> and we're not done. <laughs> but I mean, just to tell you, even the owner had a fair amount of proposals that usually we don't like value engineering. <laughs> Right, I think everyone's looking at the clock and seeing that it's 5.08, so perfect timing, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.